What's up my pre-calc people? I'm Michael Pritchak. In this video, I wanna talk about a couple really, really tough problems that a lot of my students really struggle with when it comes to unit one of the AP pre-calculus course. Now, these problems overall aren't too difficult once you get the big ideas, but for some kids, those big ideas can be a little bit tough. So let's talk about these two problems right now. That way, if they show up on the AP exam or unit test in your class, you'll get them right. So in this first problem, we are told that the function g of x is a quadratic function. Over the interval two to five, the average rate of change is five. Over the interval five to eight, the average rate of change is negative two. What is the average rate of change over the interval 14 to 17? Now for a lot of kids, they're not even quite sure what this question is asking. So let's kind of walk through it here. So we're told that over the interval two to five, the average rate of change, I'll just use AROC for average rate of change, is a positive five. So over that interval, it went up five. But now that interval is three units wide. So it actually went up 15, five per each of those one units. So it had a total change of 15. Okay, and then the next interval is five to eight. And over that interval, the average rate of change was a negative two. Okay, now a couple of things I wanna notice. First off, those are consecutive equal length intervals. The first interval ended at five, the second interval started at five, and they're both three units wide. Now for that interval, the average rate of change was negative two per one unit. That means it was a total change of negative six. Again, negative two for each of those three units. Now the question is asking us about the average rate of change from 14 to 17. All right, so that's kind of far away, but let's keep going with those consecutive equal length intervals. So the next interval would be eight to 11, consecutive equal in length. Next interval, 11 to 14, again, consecutive equal in length. And the final interval is the one that we're asked about, 14 to 17. Now, most kids would be like, okay, great. So I know the average rate of change for the first two. How the heck do I get to the interval 14 to 17? Well, this is where you have to understand the definition of a quadratic function. The heart of this problem, that's really what they're focusing on, is that you know that definition of a quadratic function. And for a quadratic function, the average rates of change are linear over those equal length consecutive intervals. So again, average rates of change are linear over consecutive equal length intervals. So when we look at the average rate of change, we see that in the first interval it was five, then it went to negative two. That's a change of down seven. And because we know the definition of a quadratic function, linear rates of change, that down seven pattern is gonna continue. So the next interval is gonna be down seven again, so negative nine. The next interval is gonna be down seven again, so negative 16. The next interval is gonna be down seven again, and that's the interval we're looking for, and that's gonna be negative 23. So there's our answer. For the interval 14 to 17, the average rate of change is negative 23. And again, the most important thing in this problem is that we were A, told it's a quadratic function, and B, we started off with two consecutive equal length intervals that we could continue, that way we can continue to see that pattern of the average rates of change changing at a linear rate. All right, hopefully that made sense. Not too bad, but a lot of kids get overwhelmed. They're not quite sure what the problem's even asking. So again, this is a question that truly is focusing on the definition of a quadratic function and can you apply it to these equal size successive intervals. All right, the next question is this. The table below gives the average rate of change over select intervals of a function. Over what interval is the change the greatest? So first let's process what we're given. We're given five intervals that are not necessarily equal in length. They are consecutive. They each start where the other one ended off, but they're not consecutive or they're not equal in length. So the first one was negative one to zero. That's a change of one. Then zero to one. That's a change of one. Then one to three. That's a change of two. Three to seven is a change of four and seven to nine is another change of two. So again, those are not equal intervals, which, you know, is a little bit, make this a little bit tricky, but that actually doesn't matter to the problem because the question is simply saying over what interval is the change the greatest? Now, what most kids do that I've experienced in class is they just grab that first one because it says the average rate of change is 12. 12 compared to negative three, five, and two, and seven is a bigger number, so they think that's the answer. But no, it wants to know which one has the greatest change, not the greatest average rate of change. Yes, if the question says greatest average rate of change, that first interval is the winner, but it wants to know the greatest change. So let's think about this. In this first interval, what was the change? Well, the interval was one unit wide with an average of 12. That's 12 per unit, right? 12 per one unit. So for that one unit, the change was plus 12. All right, that's done. The next interval, it was one unit wide as well, and the average per one unit was negative three. So that means in totality, it changed negative three. So, so far, positive 12 is still our winner. 
And the next interval, it was two units wide, two units wide. One to three is two units wide with an average of five per unit. So five for each of those units is a total change of plus 10, five per each unit. All right, well, unfortunately, plus 12 is still our winner as of now. Our next interval was four units wide, three to seven, four units wide with an average change of two per one unit. So for those four units, two, 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 that's a total change of eight. So once again, positive 12 is still our winner. And the finer interval is two units wide from seven to nine with an average of one per unit, or excuse me, seven per one unit. That means we're gonna have a total change of 14. So for each of those two units over that interval, there was an average of seven per unit. That's a total change of 14. So winner, 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 there is our interval that has the greatest change, seven to nine. Now the biggest problem I've seen is that students look at this and they don't look at the table correctly. They look at the table as output values, not average rates of change. So they think that those are output values, 12, negative three, five, two, and seven, and then they try to look at the change. They say, oh, well, from 12 to negative three, that's, you know, I went down 15. And then from three to five, I went up eight. They try to like do it like that. But A, you can't do that because these are not output values. These are average rates of change. And we don't have those consecutive equal length intervals so that way we can analyze it like that. So we have to do is simply say, okay, in each interval, I know the average rate of change. I know how wide that interval was. So I could figure out the total change because I know average rate of change is a per one unit thing. And then what we find out is that that last interval where the average was seven, but that interval was two units wide, seven plus seven, seven for each unit, 14 total change there, the biggest of them all. All right, so hopefully if these problems come up on the AP exam or on a unit test in your class, you'll nail them. But I noticed that these are two questions that a lot of my students get wrong at the first try. All right, good luck.